Okay, welcome everyone to Virtual Pro Pride from Equity Towards Justice. This event is part of our 2021 Virtual Pro Pride series that is focused on moving beyond diversity, equity, and inclusion. My name is Angela Facundo, and I'm a member of the Pride at Work Canada Board of Directors, as well as an assistant adjunct professor at Queen's University based in Toronto, Ontario. I use the pronouns she, her, and they, them, and I am pleased to be your MC today. This session is being recorded, and you will find at the bottom of your screen that closed captioning is available, being provided by National Captioning Canada. As this session is in Zoom webinar mode, uh, participants are able to use uh, the chat and our Q&A box, but you will not be able to turn on your videos or audio. The session will last one and a half hours, ending at 1.30 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. If you're experiencing any technical difficulties, we encourage you to connect with our team, including Prugerm and, or Connor Peon. If this is the first time you've been at a Pride at Work Canada event, or if you join us every, uh, if you're joining us every time, we are happy to have you. Through dialogue, education, and thought leadership, Pride at Work Canada empowers employers to build workplaces that celebrate all employees, regardless of gender expression, gender identity, and sexual orientation. We help create safer, more inclusive workspaces that realize the full potential of all employees and bring down barriers to employment. Our learning, networking, and community events happen across the country, celebrating and connecting the most inclusive Canadian employers. As with all our events, it is important that we recognize that Pride at Work Canada works on their traditional territories of the First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. This includes Two-Spirit and LGBTQ Indigenous people. We recognize that there are multiple barriers that impact Two-Spirit and LGBTQ Indigenous people from accessing meaningful, affirming, and inclusive employment. In our work, we look to reduce those barriers and are open to feedback from Indigenous workers, employers, and job seekers in making that a reality. Today, we will have presenters who live on multiple different traditional territories, but in the spirit of reconciliation, I would like to acknowledge with respect that Pride at Work Canada's main office is based in Toronto, Toronto, also known as the Dish with One Spoon Territory. It is traditionally the home of the Anishinaabe, Huron-Wendat, Chippewa, Haudenosaunee, and the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. Toronto is covered by Treaty 13, signed with the Mississaugas of the Credit and the Williams Treaties signed with multiple Mississaugas and Chippewa bands. Today, Toronto is home to Indigenous people from across Turtle Island. I would like to thank the support of Norton Rose Fulbright in making today's event a reality. They have sent us a video to welcome us to our virtual Pro Pride today. Welcome Pro Priders. Happy Pride Month, everyone. Uh, we are very excited to be here and welcome you to this year's virtual justice event for Pro Pride. Justice is about doing work to dismantle the barriers equity deserving groups face to accessing opportunities. A lot of hard work has been done to dismantle some of the barriers faced by members of the LGBTQ plus community and to obtain justice and some real equity under the law. But that work is not done. I think it's our privilege and responsibility as members of the legal profession to continue that work. As a firm, we are privileged that we've had the opportunity to make an impact and to use our voice to support the LGBTQ plus community with our pro bono work. I was very excited, for example, by the outcome when we represent the city of Langley, when it had its right to fly the pride flag during pride week upheld. We also recently successfully argued that certain provisions of the civil code in Quebec and its regulations are discriminatory and thus invalid. 
That decision, if it's upheld on appeal, will have an impact on the day-to-day -day lives of trans, non-binary, and intersex individuals trying to obtain official identification documents that correspond to their gender identity. And it will hopefully reduce some of the discrimination that they face daily. We are also very excited and honored to work so closely with Pride at Work to ensure that we make an impact both externally and internally in creating justice, equity, and inclusion. We are so proud to support this session and all the amazing work that Pride at Work is doing. We would also like to thank our community sponsor, uh, the Black Human Resources Professionals of Canada, who are a volunteer-led not-for-profit representing Black HR professionals and the many intersectionalities they embody. This event is important to Black HRPC as they work and advocate alongside the LGBTQ2S uh, 2S plus community and others who have been historically excluded from experiencing the safety and inclusion that comes from equity in the workplace. We want to give a warm welcome to their members who are in the audience today. Today's event is focusing on moving from equity towards justice. Equity in the workplace uh, is often driven by a sense of legal need and the pursuit of fairness. This goal, although admirable, often focuses on addressing equity in the moment with each employee or potential job seeker instead of addressing historical wrongs. Canada has histories of injustice, uh, but we are moving towards a more just future, starting with truth. For instance, the LGBT purge, where members of the Canadian Armed Forces, the RCMP, and the Federal Public Service were systematically discriminated against, harassed, and often fired as a matter of policy and sanctioned practice. These community members only found justice in June 2018 with a historic settlement of the class action lawsuit for the survivors, but many never saw that justice. Last Pride season, members of the Black Lives Matter uh, group brought to light uh, the continued injustice that Black Canadians experience by police and within many communities, including the LGBTQ2 community. According to research by Statistic Canada, women, uh, Black women continue to face the highest rates of economic injustice in the nation. Though little research has been done about the economic realities of Black LGBTQ2 Canadians, the, Can the study based in uh, the United States entitled a Broken Bargain for LGBT Workers of Color found that Black LGBTQ2 plus people face the highest rates of economic injustice, in particular, Black trans women. We also cannot address justice without giving honor and recognition to the tragic discoveries of the remains of First Nations children at former residential schools across Canada. The discoveries at former residential schools, which ran from 1831 until 1997, uh, come after years of residential school survivors' oral testimonies. We also know that Two-Spirit and Indigiqueer uh, continue to face many barriers to economic justice, uh, from the historical traumas of the residential schools, 60s Scoop, and more. Indigenous communities also continue to this day to experience a digital divide to accessing stable internet, not to mention the 51 enduring long-term drinking water advisories. We have a long way to go to reach a nation where every individual can achieve their full potential at work, regardless of gender expression, gender identity, and sexual orientation. We are grateful for your presence in today's discussions to help move us in the direction of justice. Today, we'll get to hear from a panel of experts who are working to create justice for gender, romantic, and sexual minorities in the workplace. We are honored that Harlan Pruden will be our opening discussion. Uh, Harlan Pruden, Nahio First Nations Cree Nation, works with and for the Two-Spirit community locally nationally and internationally. Currently, Harlan is an Indigenous Knowledge Translation Lead at Chimamuk, 
an indigenous public health program at BC Center for Disease Control, and is also a co-founder of the Two-Spirit Dry Lab, North America's first research group and lab that exclusively focuses on two-spirit people, communities, and or experiences. Harlan is also the managing editor of the twospiritjournal.com and an advisory member for the Canadian Institute of Health Research's Institute of Gender and Health. Before relocating to Vancouver in 2015, Harlan was co-founder and a director of NYC community-based organization, the Northeast Two-Spirit Society, and was a President Obama appointee to uh, the US Presidential Advisory Council on HIV AIDS, PACHA, and uh, provided advice, information, and recommendations to the Secretary of Health and Human Services at the White House. In December 2018, Harlan was happily dismissed from PASHA by Mr. Trump via FedEx. <laughs> Welcome, Harlan. I will hand it over to you. Greetings. Harlan uh, Greetings, my relatives. My government name is Harlan Pruden. Um, my Indian name, and I use the I word, um, you can ask me why later. Um, uh, is Wakatnomani. It's actually in Sioux. I was doing some work on the Rosebud Reservation and they honored me with the name Wakatnomani. Wakat being spirit, like good spirit, bad spirit, neutral spirit. Like I can do good just as well as I can do bad. Or I can like um, suck up a lot of space and do absolutely nothing. Um, so that part of my name is a responsibility of how do I want to show up? And so I try to show up with good words, good actions, good thoughts. Okay, I have to work on the thoughts part. And um, gnome is two, and mani is a sacred journey. Uh, so I was going to get that translated into Cree. I am First Nations Cree. My mother's from the Beaver Lake Indian Reserve. My father's from the Saddle Lake Indian Reserve. Two different reservations with the same treaty six territory. Um, I am so honored and blessed uh, that I get to call um, and have been welcomed by uh, the Squamish, Wesleyan, and Slaver Tooth First Nations uh, people. Um, who's on traditional unceded and uh, ancestral territory uh, that I work, live, and play today. Y'all would probably refer to that as Vancouver, um, but it is Squamish, Musqueam, and Slay, which is the territory. Uh, as for pronouns, Cree is gender neutral and thereby gender inclusive. Um, we, our third person singular uh, pronoun literally translates into it, similar, um, and so how I keep that alive is um, of our language and culture and ways is that anything that is said mindfully and respectfully for pronouns, even it, um, I will respond to. Um, one is I'm so honored and humbled to be here and with the amazing panelists. And I just thank um, you all uh, as well as all of the guests that have joined into this amazing conversation. So a few days ago, we had a prep and a tech meeting. And at that meeting, I was just like, oh, I have like these, this time to actually do some opening and framing remarks uh, for today's gathering. And in my silliness of my work here at BCCDC, as we wind down COVID and still respond to COVID, but we're shifting back to um, our work of trying to improve health outcomes for indigenous people. Um, of course, I left all of that till last night. I didn't get, and so I've been like reflecting a lot of like, what can I really say about justice? And after reading the amazing bios, I reviewed the bios and I was just like, um, and I was like, what do I really have to offer and can offer around this discussion around moving from equity or beyond equity to justice? Um, and what do I have to offer after like reading the bios of these amazing panelists for our discussions? And so I just want to, um, last night is, I don't know, I was the first person in my family to go to uh, college or go to university. So I was a first generation. There. And I remember when I was like sitting down and doing my course uh, schedule, intro to Western philosophy. And I was like, I'll learn like Western philosophy, right? Because I want to learn how those folks think. And I remember one of the first textbooks that I ever read was um, 
Bloom's translation of uh, Plato's Republic, right? <laughs> so funny because when I started reading Plato's Republic, I phonetically pronounced out the name of Polmarchus, rather than Polymarchus, Telemachus. Um, and it's so funny because like Socrates was Socrates, like Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. It's like, that was me, like phonetically pronouncing these names out, right? But um, what I found was like for Dr. Birch, who was this amazing storyteller. And what I loved about Dr. Birch is, is that yes, we would do our mandatory uh, required readings, but then in during the course, uh, sorry, during the lectures twice a week, for 90 minutes, he would like retell the story of the section that we were reading in Plato's Republic, and then we would open up for discussions. And I loved his retelling of the story of Bloom's translation of Plato's Republic. And, and so why am I starting the conversation there? In that Plato's Republic is one of the founding and foundational documents where we take up for Western thought of the conversation of what is justice. And I remember like getting to the last required section of like how Plato's Republic in which that the philosopher King emerges from the darkness of the cave where the shadows and the world of people like trying to make and where the philosopher King emerges into the light and comes out of the cave. And then the entire conversation in which that we took up is like, can the philosopher king go back into the cave, the darkness, and can they bring more folks out of the cave? And what does that look like? And is that possible? And then like all of these other conversations around justice. And I was just like, wow, right? And I remember like picking up these debates and discussions of around ju justice. And I remember at, it wasn't a required reading, but there was a couple of extra pages of the translation. And I remember going to Dr. Birch because it was a required reading, I didn't read it. And I was like, hey, Dr. Birch, how did Plato's Republic end? And Dr. Birch, Robert said, you know, that's a really good question. No one really ever asked that question. And he goes, um, how it ended is all of the discussants, Plato, uh, Cephalus, Polymarchus, Telemachus, um, they all went and dined and feasted. And I was like, wow, here is a foundational conversation, a com foundational text of taking up the question of what is justice? And that had laid the groundwork for many of the conversations that we have today. We can stream it back to or tie it back. Yet at the same time, it is like no one has gone through and looked at like, how did the actual book end? And so I told myself the story about like going for dinner and the act of being and sharing and feasting on the bounties of the world has to offer rather than the philosopher king debates. But last night when I was like reflecting upon that sprinkled throughout this foundational do document around justice is Plato and all of his cohorts and his peers were all being serviced by slaves. And then the dinner party, and although I didn't go back and read it, the dinner party more than likely was served by slaves. How is it that we have this foundational document of justice and the bountiness of the, the sharing of that dinner party being serviced by slaves and by farmers who had to produce all of the work so that a few could dine and enjoy the luxuries of that. And so I was just like, well, how do we make sense of like how, like Plato and this document in which that there are slaves. And I think that Plato is holding up a, mark, a, a mirror for us and defining the problem. And then I was like reflecting last night of like all of the work and how the imagery of the dinner party of sharing the bounty of that the world has to offer. 
I like that. And, but I think that one, it, until we actually create spaces in which that the slaves and everyone is invited to that table, there will be no justice. And the reflection upon my work and also for this esteemed panel will more than likely talk about sharing. It is very simple. But sharing means in which that the table is that it has to be expanded and as a result, the resources must be shared. It also means that the, the philosopher kings or the folks like Plato, Keplis, Telemachus, is that they have to give a little. And that rather than eating 22 pomegranates, they may only eat like two pomegranates. It is also sharing in which like, like Mary Simpson and the first indigenous governor general into a leadership position sharing decision-making processes. Like I loved Mary um, and she was like, yeah, people think that the governor general appointment is a figurehead position. And she said, mm, it can be a figurehead, but I ultimately have to sign off on legislation. She was like, mm, that doesn't sound figurehead to me. And what she was like saying and signaling is, is that I'm going to do my due diligence before I sign off on legislation. And so I think that if you go back to that dinner party and that feasting, it comes down to around sharing. Because I don't know how else to make sense of that text and that dinner party. And, and then I like look at like all of the different ways in which that my advocacy, my activism, my community organizing for Indigenous as well as Two-Spirit people has always been, and I just have to find different ways of saying sharing, to share. And it's simple, but yet so incredibly difficult because the colonizers, they don't wanna share. Because that means that they have to give up some of their power, some of their privilege, and ultimately some of their decision-making processes plus the reflection that Western thought, that you actually haven't read all of your texts. You haven't done the analysis. And what do we do with those slaves? Now, I put in um, the uh, text, I mean, in the uh, chat bunch, a little, um, link to a piece that I wrote for uh, the two spirit journal uh, com calling visibility matters why the LGBT acronym, however you want to like frame it should be led first by two spirit 2s hyphen or not hyphen LGBTQIA plus QIA plus and how like for this land is um, on this territory, Two-Spirit were the first gender and sexual or uh, gender minorities. And that should be gestured by us being listed first. And rather doing the, the importation of Western politics of like BIPOC, BIPOC, Black Indigenous People of Color, here in this territory, in this land, it should be Indigenous first. Indigenous or I, BIPOC, being that we are the first people, we should be listed first. Now, I end with that remark because I so many people like will take up that as maybe the call of like re reorientating and putting two spirit first. That's just dressings. Until there's actual changes in which that there is sharing in decision, in resource use, and how we take up and share space for one another. The listing of 2S first doesn't amount to anything unless there is actual changes and then there is a relinquishing of power and control. But then we have one day justice. So don't get confused over justice being listing of two spirit first. We want that. But more importantly, we want Mary Simons 
as well as other folks within leadership positions so that we can self-determine, self-actualize, and so that we will know where we are going rather than being told where we're going. I think that this conversation around the philosopher kings and all of the subsequent thoughts that have bled from that text, I think they're okay, but I think that they kind of cloud the actual work of moving from beyond equity to justice, and justice is simply sharing. It is with that that I say, Kilonas um, Kumpimena, Wawa, Hai Hai, Examaga. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Harlan. I really appreciate that. Love that call to action uh, for us to learn further. And also, um, in particular, I teach Plato's Republic. So I loved your reading <laughs> of that and the emphasis of the fundamental contradictions that underlie. Western knowledge and Western thought. So thank you for bringing that uh, to our attention. Um, uh, really, really appreciated that reading. Uh, now I'd like to introduce Jade uh, Pichette, uh, they, them, Manager of Programs, Prado Work Canada. Uh, Jade is an inclusion and diversity professional based in Toronto, Toronto. Uh, currently Jade serves as the Manager of Programs at Prado Work Canada, where they work with over 150 large employers across Canada around sexual orientation, gender identity, and gender expression inclusion. Uh, take it away, Jade, please. Thank you, Angela. Um, dealing with tech. Uh, hopefully folks can can see me and hear me now. Um, I'm very grateful uh, for the uh, 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 remarks by Harlan as well as uh, Angela for bringing us in um, both in a good way. Um, and also I uh, need to go back and read Plato's Republic now and, and really look at it from that lens because I definitely did not remember that, that final piece. Um, and I think that call to sharing as a intro to how we look at justice and how we create justice is a major piece. So I'm very grateful today that I have an amazing uh, uh, number of panelists who uh, some days I feel like this is just my excuse to talk to amazing people. Um, so I'm very grateful uh, today for, for our three panelists. Um, so our first panelist today um, is Shelley Skinner, who is the president of founder of Uplift Black. Um, uh, she is a activist, social entrepreneur, educator, and community builder with her lived experience of homelessness, racism, domestic and sexual violence, and Black queer homophobia and discrimination. She carries a story of inspirational perseverance, resiliency, and dedication to the betterment of her community. In 2020, amid a global pandemic, Shelley uh, founded Uplift Black, a social service agency dedicated to increasing the visibility and social uh, socioeconomic development of local Black communities, um, and now a partner, a community partner, Fred or Canada as well, um, to combat homophobia among the Black community and to challenge misogynoir. Uplift Black is anchored in 2S LGBTQ plus inclusivity and hopes of leading the change in what uh, it means to be a diverse and inclusive social impact agency. Welcome, Shelley. Next, we have Aaron DeVore, Dr. Aaron DeVore, who is the Chair of Transgender Studies at the University of Victoria. Um, he is the founder and inaugural chair of in Transgender Studies, founder and subject matter expert of the Transgender Archives, uh, the founder and host of Moving Trans History Forward, which is, in my opinion, my favorite conference that I ever get to go to, um, a professor of sociology department at the University of Victoria. And he has been studying and teaching about transgender topics since the early 1980s and published widely on transgender topics, including as the author of four books and editor of one. Deli he has delivered public lectures to audiences around the world, including more than 35 keynote and plenary addresses. He's a national award-winning teacher, uh, a fellow of the Society of S Scientific Study of Sexuality, an elected member of the International Academy of Sex Research. 
He is also the former Dean of Graduate Studies uh, from 2002 to 2012 and a professor of sociology at the University of Victoria in British Columbia, Canada. Welcome, Aaron. And third, we have Derek Inman, a Senior Policy Analyst at the Federal Anti-Racism Secretariat of Canadian Heritage. Um, he's a team lead and Senior Policy Analyst with the Interdepartmental, Intergovernmental and International Affairs Unit with the Federal Anti-Racism Secretariat. Um, he was a former researcher uh, in uh, uh, the University in Brussels, whose name I will mispronounce. I do not know Dutch, I apologize, uh, where he's published a number of journal articles and book chapters. Uh, visiting researcher at the Center for Human Rights at the University of Pretoria and a joint PhD candidate at the VUB and the University of Antwerp. Works, uh, he's worked with the Sexual Orientation Gender Identity Section at the International Commission of Tourists, the Presidency Section at the International Criminal Court, and the International Criminal Justice Unit at the University of Nottingham's Human Rights Law Center. Before working internationally for a number of years, Derek worked in the public service with roles at Canadian Heritage, Public Safety Canada, the House of Commons, and Employment and Social Development Canada. So welcome, Derek. So I'm very grateful for uh, the uh, three of you being with me today. Um, you're all really, really amazing speakers, and I'm, I'm so grateful um, uh, for you to be joining us. Uh, Derek and, and Aaron, let's just get your videos on um, as well. Um, and so I'm very grateful uh, for this conversation. Um, and I apologize, I would normally be wearing a suit jacket, but it was extremely warm. We're having a bit of a heat wave in Takaranto. Um, uh, but this conversation of justice is one that I think often when we talk about equity, um, we're really looking at that individual moment. Um, uh, whether that's that moment with the, the individual who's asking for accommodations or is who experienced uh, discrimination, but that doesn't necessarily look at the bigger picture of, of ourselves uh, at, in, in relation to our privilege, in terms of our organizations and the processes that we've put in place to address those historical wrongs. Um, and to start, I, I want to level set with everyone. So this discussion of equity was brought into the EI because we're not seeing a quality of outcome. Uh, but there has been many critiques that equity doesn't always address these historical wrongs, which we have touched on previously. Uh, what would you consider justice in the workplace for 2S LGBTQIA plus communities? And, and let's uh, start with Shelly on that one. Hi, thank you so much. Um, I'm still taken back by um, Harlan's um, opening. That I'm sitting right in my heart, so thank you so much for that. Um, what do I consider justice? I consider justice, justice action. Um, I consider justice um, accountability, right? It's really taking that, um, that approach to look within yourself and, and, and find um, where can I make change? Where can, where can I uplift, right? Um, and it, it doesn't matter where, where you sit. For myself, I started an organization. I've, I have um, volunteered my time um, while living homeless, right? I truly believe in community. I truly believe that community can heal. I think that was um, the COVID pandemic. The, the greatest thing is that it, it forced us all home, right? And to look at our homes, um, you know, and the work that I'm doing, you know, outside of urban centers is really important because what we're seeing is, um, you know, a lot of performative action, you know, a lot of everybody wants the likes on their social medias. Um, everybody wants to, um, to, to, to do the, you know, the, like, just to kind of paint over the, you know, the, the dent instead of actually fixing it. Right. Um, and with Uplift Black, what we what we did is we decided to get together literally as just a community to make change. And within that, we looked at within ourselves and, you know, um, you know, are we, are we diverse individuals? Are we going to be looking in um, and collaborating together? 
you know, just because we say black doesn't mean it's only black run. Um, we have to call in our allies and we have to work alongside them for, for change. And um, we got to do that, um, you know, but, we, but in that we can't allow them to just sit there and just be, um, you know, just be perform performative. Just, and when I say performative, I feel, you know, really truly what it is, is that it's that acting, right? You know, it's that, it's that, you know, what can I do to create a spectacle, right? To create the attention, look at me, look at me. Right, but actionable change is it, it, it takes you out of the equation completely, right? And it, it makes you look at others around you. And uh, so, as a leader, you know, in the community, it, it's about collaboration for me, and it's about um, stepping back where I don't have a voice because I don't have the experience, uh, and I and challenging other leaders um, to do the same. Thank you. Yeah, I, I really hear this. You know, we, we need to take that moment to step back. We need to evaluate ourselves and the, the communities that we surround ourselves in as well and and see yeah. who are we missing at the table and who are or we need to move out of the table maybe sometimes for as well. Absolutely. Uh, that gatekeeping exists um, and, it, and, it's, and it's really, really hard to kind of break through those um, those situations, but we have to continuously challenge um, our communities, our leaders, um, people who are in power, and to, to, to get them to move out of the way, literally. Thank you. So I'm going to jump over to Aaron. So what would you consider justice in the workplace for our communities? Oh, your uh, microphone is not on, Aaron. Oh, sorry. Okay, starting again. So uh, saying, saying hello to everybody uh, across the country. It's morning here. So I'm saying good morning from here. And I want to start with uh, territorial acknowledgement. I'm at the University of Victoria and we acknowledge and respect the Lekwungen speaking peoples on whose traditional territory the University of Victoria stands and the uh, Songhees, Esquimalt and the Saanich peoples whose historical relationships with the land continue to this day. And I thank uh, everyone else for making the acknowledgements that they've been making. And I want to thank uh, Pride at Work and my colleagues on the panel and all the folks behind the scenes uh, for sponsoring this event and for inviting me to be part of it. Uh, and Shelly, I love seeing the flags flying in the background behind you. That's a great, great touch. Uh, so justice, um, you know, the simplest answer, I think, is that justice is about fairness. But fairness is a very complex uh, concept and fairness means uh, different pe different things to a lot of people and it means different things in different contexts and so some of the ways that i've seen people apply the concept of fairness or justice is um, to say well we treat everybody the same uh, that's fairness and of course that's one that i I would reject, and I think probably most people on this call have given some thought to it and realized that we're not all the same. And so to treat us all the same, it does not actually work out to a fair outcome and is not actually uh, justice in the long run. Uh, another um, answer that you'll often get to, well, what do you mean by fair, uh, is that, well, we uh, recognize and re reward merit. And again, there's so many different ways that you can define what is merit and the context is different and, and the meaning is different in so many different places. And uh, I'd be the last person to say that we don't want people to do their best and to put their best work forward, absolutely. But what do we consider best has to be looked at in um, particular context to understand what is useful, what is meaningful, what is important, and what should we value. And of course, we know that um, people who have been doing their, their best and doing great work in one context are completely unrecognized and unrewarded in, in, in another context. So, you know, to say merit is not sufficient either. Uh, more recently, we see people talking about, well, what's fair is to provide supports to people so that we can level the playing field. And again, I think there is, if I may use the word, some merit to that argument, uh, but you have to ask, well, what playing field are we playing on? Uh, and you know, are the, the rules of the game and the, um, what counts as um, accomplishment, are they fair measures? And so if we don't change the rules of the game and we just say, well, we're gonna say, 
we're going to help you to reach the standard that we've always used. Uh, again, that's not exactly justice in my mind. It's not exactly fairness in my mind. It's, it's a contribution. It's something to consider. But we have to look at the larger picture of what are the values that we are attempting to help people reach, that we will now consider, OK, we're going to help you reach this, this level of merit that we've determined is the same level of merit that we've always used. And well, it's not enough. Uh, Another approach that some people take is to prioritize target groups, uh, um, or, uh, prioritizing and targeting groups so they redress, redress past inequalities. Uh, I think you know there's a lot of again merit to that approach, uh, it, but if you don't look at the whole system and what the values are and what we're trying to reach and what we consider um, the best outcome, even that's not good enough. But I would say you know some combination of those will go a long way towards uh, reaching justice if we look at the whole picture in terms of what it is that we consider uh, a, an outcome that we're trying to get to. Uh, it's everybody's job to, to work on this. Uh, it's not just the people who are seeking equity and seeking justice. Uh, it's not just the people who have the power now. Everybody has to work on this. We don't all come to it with the same skills. We don't come to it with the same talents and understanding, but we all have to, to work on it. And it's different for each of us. Uh, so I, I wanna just finish my comments with a, a, a small anecdote. Uh, years ago, I was discussing with a fellow by the name of Igor Khan. Igor is now dead, but he was kind of the Kinsey of Russia when he was alive. He's a, a Russian scholar, he's a sexologist and very influential. And I was talking about rights for gender and sexual minorities. And I said something about um, tolerance. And he said, no, 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 tolerance is not what you want. Uh, I said, oh, right, you're right, of course, we want acceptance. Uh, he said, no, no, if you want acceptance, they're still treating you like there's something different and inferior about you, but they're willing to accept that and, and overlook it. Not good enough. I said, okay, Igor, what is it that we want? And he says, what you want is indifference. He says, what you want is for it to not matter, to be of no consequence, uh, unimportant. And I took a big lesson from that, and I've thought about it a lot more since then. And I would add to that, accept. Because there are times when our difference is very important and our difference is relevant. And brings, we bring special knowledge and special skills and special talents that are applicable in some situations. And in other situations, they really are, should be irrelevant and it should be of no importance. And so for me, justice is when we have the right balance of recognizing people's special talents and what we bring as individuals and as members of communities with particular histories and knowledges. And for those differences being unimportant when they're irrelevant to the task at hand or what we're doing. So that's a vision that I keep of what kind of justice I would like to see. Thank you for that, Aaron. Yeah, I'm really hearing the, you know, the importance of recognizing the structures um, at their root and, and how, you know, if you can't bring somebody justly into an organization, if the organization in and of itself is not just and has not created the, those bases. And I'm hearing about all the different ways that um, uh, people can engage with um, and like uh, really uh, look at some of these, these challenges uh, all have some merit, but they all have uh, pieces that they miss or that they, they don't include. Um, so, I'm, I'm going to uh, head over to Derek. So certainly, I, I know you have a lot of experience in injustice, especially also from a legal perspective as well, and, and in legal situations. Um, so what would you consider justice in the workplace for uh, 2S LGBTQIA plus communities? Good morning, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I just wanted to start by acknowledging that the land on which I work and live is the traditional territory of the Algonquin An Anishinaabeg Nation. Um, and I also just want to thank Harlan for the introductory remarks and uh, thank the organization for the invitation to speak here today. Um, so I have to admit that this question is uh, quite a tricky one for me. 
um, because as someone who studied international law, defining justice to an audience should be quite easy, but sadly it's not. Uh, justice can't simply mean determining criminal responsibility of an individual. Justice has the possibility of providing so much more, a remedy, the deliverance of truth, and the creation of a historical record, all of which serve to recognize the experiences of victims and survivors. The idea of remedy must be divorced from its restrictive origins, where reparations were put into effect by returning someone to a position similar to the one they were in before the harm was done. Instead, remedy in times of violence must be seen from a broad approach, where justice must serve as an agent for individual and collective healing. The process of collective and individual healing can begin with truth telling and the recognition that there is not one singular truth, but instead many truths, sometimes even competing truths, that should be allowed to enter the discourses of justice. A more complete picture of what and how that happened that incorporates these truths can be achieved by witnesses being allowed to disclose a full and public account of the events that transpired and how they experienced it. Only then will the historical record documented be seen as more whole. Allowing these truths to permeate the dialogue serves to inform the content of the historical record that is created, permitting the survivors to feel as though their experiences gave birth to the narratives that underpin the proceedings. Such an inclusive narrative can have particularly positive outcomes for those who experience discrimination. The creation of the narrative becomes part of the healing process as it acknowledges that those affected were not victims of acts that simply happened or acts that are random or incidental acts that are not placed within a contextual framework. Rather the narrative that is created by this type of holistic truth is one that recognizes that survivors were targeted because of their identities. The acceptance of this narrative based on identities particularly intersectional ones, is critical if processes truly want to recognize and acknowledge that violence of this form has its own particular characteristics and it is only with this acceptance that justice will be served and crimes come to surface. Now for our purposes, uh, we can see some positive experiences emanating from the settlement brought forth by the survivors of the LGBT purge, something that was discussed earlier by Angela. If we look at the final settlement agreement, um, there's a series of mandated consultations between federal entities and subject matter experts. And based on assessments of participating federal entities, 23 recommendations have been provided. And uh, I'll just list a couple of the foundational ones um, that are in the report. Um, so one of the ones is to conduct formal consultations with LGBTQI2S employees, networks, external subject matter experts, and or other stakeholders during the development and review of all organizational policies, procedures, practices. Publish explicit, explicit goals for LGBTQI2S inclusion within EDI strategy or within a dedicated strategy document accompanied by clear progress monitoring and evaluation metrics. Apply an intersectional lens to the development and review of all EDI initiatives, including specific consideration to possible implications for all LGBTQI2S identities. And there's a number more, but I do recommend that um, if we follow these recommendations, that's perhaps the first step towards a more restorative justice for the 2S LGBTQ plus communities in the federal government and similar reflections should happen in other sectors as well. Thank you for that, Derek. It's, it's uh, I think a lot of people, they hear about things like the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and the, the Purge Fund and don't often actually read the recommendations that are based within. So some of the things that I'm hearing is this importance of, of just not just recognizing truth, but recognizing the fact that there have been concrete things that organizations and, and individuals can engage with that have been stated publicly, that have been explicitly brought to light, um, but haven't had enough focus. So I, I, I really appreciate that. Uh, one of my core beliefs when it comes to justice is that we can't truly address justice without looking at the very specific intersections within our communities and recognizing that not all members of our communities have the same experiences. So for example, as a white settler who is of mostly um, uh, Scottish, English, and French Canadian uh, descent, 
born on the traditional territories of the Anishinaabe Algonquin peoples known as Ottawa and now living in the Dish with One Spoon territory being Toronto or Takaranto, I have a lot of privileges based on that. However, I'm also disabled. I'm also non-binary. Happy International Non-Binary People's Day, everyone, by the way. Um, uh, you know, I'm, I, I'm many other pieces of myself. And so my experiences are different than those of our panelists as well. And theirs are different from mine. So Shelly, I'm going to go back to you. So it, it was mentioned that during the COVID-19 pandemic and in the wake of uh, George Floyd and, and many other um, and continued um, uh, killings by police, um, you found it Uplift Black. Um, so what are some of the disparities that you see for 2S LGBTQIA plus Black employees and job seekers in finding justice in the workplace? Absolutely. Well, you know, one of the things that we are as an agency is that we do advocacy work. Um, it's an important part of the of the pillars of support that we do for the community. And that allows us an opportunity to to hear the stories firsthand from community members who are, you know, looking for any kind of advocacy or, or information um, or resources in order to get the justice that they, they that they need. And especially in the workplace, that seems to be the, um, the biggest um, you know, concerns. And what we're seeing is, um, you know, a lot of hiring um, and, and executive roles without actually having the policies and procedures in place, um, the cultural competency to be working with these individuals um, that they're hiring. Um, so it, it's a hire and fire or they're not lasting their three months probation. Um, so that's happening a lot. Um, we're having a lot of, um, you know, uh, just the, the workplace can be really toxic at the, right now as we are seeing that there are a lot of desperate business owners and uh, you know trying to do whatever it takes to cut the the funding anywhere they can because they are struggling and it is a pandemic so that's understandable but what, what they're seeing is they're also you know it's in the treatment of um the employees as well you know like what how they're being treated we're finding um in the education sector um you know that there are teachers that are leaving and in vast numbers that are racialized um or members of the lgbtq plus community because of the intersection identities within them they've already had such incredible amount of stress and layers added um you know on just dealing with uh you know homophobia racism toxic work environments and now they have the, the added pressures of of performance that's needed for uh you know to, be, to to make the communities happy in these in these roles and they can't handle it so they're leaving and they're and they're and they're leaving in um in ways that are putting them in a in a place of being desperate financially um you know because they're, they're not they don't have certain things in place but their mental health is taking a toll. And that's the biggest thing that I'm noticing, um, the mental health um, of, of uh, racialized and, and um, queer and, and trans community members. They're just, it is so, it's such a struggle there um, with having to put the pressures of the COVID pandemic, as well as everything else that they've been kind of, you know, been layered in their experiences. Um, so the, uh, the the head to our communities is pretty vast and, it, it, and it's playing out in, our abilities to to have a roof over our head um and then we think about just work in general a lot of us um, work in the arts and uh, the arts community work in and hairstyling and so these jobs are they're they're gone um you know so there's those added um layers so they're desperate for to get into workplaces um and possibly taking jobs and roles in environments that aren't that, that aren't healthy and so we're trying to navigate how to educate the community, um, you know, and be that, um, that, that support role as much as possible right now. That seems like very, very important work, you know, creating those spaces um, for others. And uh, uh, for those who uh, are, are interested, there is a barbecue fundraiser for Uplift Black um, that people should definitely go to. Um, so, you know, some of the things I'm hearing is this, uh, increased impact of COVID-19 on um, yes. not just Black communities, but also, you know, 2S LGBTQ communities and those who are experiencing, who 
have both of those intersections and or more um, yeah. are usually the first people to be cut, the first people to be considered um, a, a, a challenge or a problem. Um, you know, you mentioned kind of the cycle that happens um, uh, in terms of especially uh, this was first referenced in terms of women of color come into an organization, um, are celebrated in a tokenistic way, um, and then once they start addressing experiences of discrimination are then scapegoated yeah. and headed out yeah. of the organization. Or even just doing the work that they were hired to do. Like they, mm. and, but what, but the, the spotlight is not, it's not a lot of things, The people aren't comfortable. There's still, there's still a lot of fear there. Um, and th also there's a lot of um, it ha things happening where they're hiring um, people who are desperate. So mm -hmm. community members who are, are, you know, who are desperate for an opportunity, any opportunity. Um, so they're more likely, you know, to put, you know, to be in these toxic situations and not say anything because they're in that, that space of desperation. But in that, in that space, now they can say, oh, look at my honorary black employee honorary trans employee right like so and it, but when you you speak to that person the first thing they're saying is this is a toxic work environment you know and they got plaques on the wall you know from saying that they're in their safe spaces you know it's just you know and when you speak to them you know and then and there's so much fear and i i, I worry that the added the added impacts like one of the pillars of support with, um, with Up With Black is pandemic and, um, and relief. Because we know that pandemic doesn't end when we all have our vaccine. We know that this, the effects of this pandemic will, will last years to come. And we, we need to be there to support those, um, those who have been most affected by it. Thank you. I think that's a very important picture for a lot of the employers who are here who may see their organizations as ones that are trying to care, are trying to provide spaces, um, but not recognizing the actual lived reality of their employees who are 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 black and queer and trans at at more marginalized levels of the organization who just aren't speaking up because they know yeah. the impact that that would have on their survival. So I, I, I yeah. really appreciate that. Uh, so I'm going to move over to Aaron. So uh, as the research chair in transgender studies, you've had an opportunity to see the historical and continued inequities for trans people in employment. Um, could you illustrate some of those barriers and historic injustices? Uh, thanks, Jade, for that question, I'd be happy to talk about that. So um, first of all, I'd like to uh, start by reminding everybody that um, the trans plus communities and by trans plus, I mean the entire range of um, gender diverse identities, uh, non, the two spirit non-binary and many others, uh, that the trans plus community uh, has the full range of intersectionalities that uh, the rest of society has uh, on top of all the gender complexities. And so uh, anything that I might say about the experience of uh, trans plus people, uh, you have to look at it through a lens of, okay, well, how is that complicated and, and compounded by people who are um, racialized or indigenous or have disabilities or are recent immigrants or a, a number of other uh, ways that the situation can be made more uh, complex and, and usually more difficult as well. Uh, now, having said that, Jade, you've asked me about historical and continuing, and I want to say that taking a long view, um, the situation is definitely improving for trans plus people in, in employment uh, circumstances and in life in general. Uh, there are better laws and um, there's better social integration, and I'm quite hopeful that today's youth, as they grow up, will have a much better experience than uh, we hear from people who are currently adults or from a generation before. Uh, so almost all uh, people who are now adults uh, grew up uh, under older and much worse conditions. Uh, and many young people today still uh, experience uh, harsh conditions that are not significantly different in, in their impact from what uh, adults and older people have experienced. And bear in mind the conditions in other parts of the world are mostly worse than in Canada. Some are similar, but Canada is among the better places in the world to be a trans plus person. So uh, too many trans plus people grow up as obviously gender diverse in unaccepting environments. And as a result, too many are harassed 
and abused in schools by teachers and by peers, and also in their homes by family members. And quite a few are either thrown out of their homes for their gender diversity or run away from home, or drop out of school early. And it's inevitable that many of the people who are growing up in those environments today and most of the adults um, that are trans plus today have um, fought against or succumbed to internalizing uh, the transphobia of the world that they uh, grew up in. And uh, for many people develop dysfunctional ways of coping. Uh, functional in the sense that it gets them through, but not functional in the sense that uh, it often in, involves um, uh, drug or alcohol problems, just low self-esteem uh, and other things that are not really very well compatible to getting a, a good job. Uh, and so as a result of all of these things, um, they've dropped out of school, they don't have training, they don't have credentials. Uh, if they're dropped out of school or they've had problems with, with coping and functioning society as a result of the um, transphobia that they've um, had to live through, uh, job history is often pretty spotty too. And that makes it very difficult for them to even enter the job market, let alone get a good job and hold a good job. Uh, now, on the other hand, there are other people who cope well, um, myself being one of them, I've had great jobs, um, and suppress their, uh, or suppress being trans for a number of years and function very well. And they tend to have better job skills and resumes. So this is not everybody in this situation, but far too many. If you look at the statistics, you'll see that trans people tend to uh, have much higher rates of unemployment, and um, despite having pretty good educational records, actually, uh, on, on the whole. And historically, and still often today, if you transition on the job, this means losing your job. Uh, today, it's illegal to fire someone for that, but people find other reasons to do that. Uh, if you have transitioned at some point as an adult and you're looking for a job, that means you have a bifurcated resume. It's got two parts to it. It's got a part before and it got, uh, got a part afterwards. And if you claim your whole resume, that outs you as trans and that um, subjects you to all sorts of transphobia and problems. Or if you hide half of your resume, then you lose your job history and you have vacant years in, in your resume. And that's not good for getting a good job. So nobody should have to hide in the closet, but many people have no choice because other people think that they look trans. Um, more trans men have the choice of keeping it quiet if they want to, um, and they can acquire some male privilege and bearing in mind you know, factors such as racialization, and indigeneity, et cetera, uh, disability and so on. But um, everybody who is outed uh, loses their privilege and is um, subject to all manner of microaggressions, harassment, abuse, uh, losing your job, as I mentioned before. Uh, and trans women on top of that are uh, suffer an extra layer of uh, trans misogyny. It may be a new word to some people, but there's misogyny, which is uh, this, or an older word for it is sexism, discrimination against women, but there's a special version of it for trans women that combines the fact that there's transphobia and there's um, uh, disregard or, or uh, women get treated badly. We know that in, in the job market and in world in general, although it is improving. And then today's International Non-Binary People's Day. And bear in mind that very few workplaces, very few places in society really um, recognize uh, non-binary people and have a clue um, what to, to do and how to treat non-binary people in the world in general and in workplaces in particular. So it's great that we're having this today on International Non-Binary People's Day because uh, that's something that even in those workplaces where people are starting to pay attention to trans plus people and to think about uh, what they need to do. Very few have given much thought to or have much idea of how to um, properly integrate non-binary people into their workplaces. Thank you for that, Aaron. I'm really hearing that, you know, some of these historical injustices that trans people experience especially start um, uh, when we're young in, in education and the like. And I, I know that's true for, for some of my experiences in terms of my story. Um, and, you know, I am very grateful that I am also one of those people who has, has gotten to succeed. And, and probably some of that is my white privilege because as an out, non-binary trans feminine person for my entire working career. Um, 
I've experienced some things. Um, and that's why I do this work. And that's why I found my way into this work because I couldn't enter other places. So I resonate very deeply with some of the pieces that you're you're putting out there. And, and um, you know, I, I really think that when we look at some of these pieces, so Aaron was mentioning the uh, legal protections that are now in place in Canada in a way that just weren't um, when uh, either Aaron or I started to do some of this work. Um, and, and so sometimes when it comes to injustice, when it comes to these issues, we need to look at the federal government and, and the uh, you know, uh, perspective that the, the federal government has in terms of addressing historical inequities. Um, and so uh, Derek, you know, on a federal government level, you've seen these historical inequities that Shelley and Aaron have been talking about. And as we know, they're faced to a greater degree by all 2S LGBTQIA, Black, Indigenous, um, and people of color in the workplace. So could you maybe dispel some of the myths that you see about some of these historical in inequalities? Because I think a lot of myths uh, still exist in regards to why should we even be looking at this and doing this work and why is justice needed? Thanks very much for that uh, question. So I think we actually have to, maybe it might be a little bit the academic side of me, but I kind of have to take a step back uh, from that question for a second and start asking uh, some questions about some of the the the, the ideas of, of myths and uh, what we need to actually dispel myths. Um, and regardless of some of the legislative progress to improve social conditions, two uh, S LGBTQ plus groups across Canada continue to experience profound material disparities and suffer significant inequities. These conditions of marginalization have been theorized in part to be related to the exposure of these groups to pervasive and persistent expressions of stigma and discrimination based on sexual and gender identity. However, there continues to be a scarcity of studies exclusively dedicated to the study of 2S LGBTQ2 plus community. In addition, given the recognized methodological challenges of collecting data from 2S LGBTQ plus communities, individuals who are often reluctant to disclose that for their fear of sober, uh, for fear of social repercussions such as stigma discrimination, the effective collection of large qualities quantities of data required to make inferences remains complex and wrought with barriers. Indeed, although there exist some Canadian studies on 2S LGBTQ plus issues and experiences that occasionally and peripherally includes data on poverty, there is a notable scarcity in empirical studies that reflect dedicated attention to employment as a central analytical concern. So before talking about myths and the need to dispel them, we need to push for more disaggregated data. We need to consider the role of multiple interlocking systems of oppression and shaping social experiences. We have to draw attention to the historical silencing of groups marginalized on more than one basis. We must gather the data that will enable us to foreground manifestations of disadvantage that reflect the interrelationship of oppression. Given that bodies of research and solid social policy addressing our communities, have commonly failed to account for differences in the issues of diverse groups, using an intersectional framework as particularly useful in helping us challenge this tendency and to draw attention to relevant idiosyncrasies in the realities of, of inequities in the workplace. A second reason for using a more inclusive framework is to account for important material disparities existing within the larger 2S LGBTQ plus collective. For example, the larger category includes white men a group whose social location has historically been closely associated with social, political, and economic advantage, while it also includes racialized trans persons, disproportionate numbers of whom are often found to live well below thresholds of poverty. It is therefore necessary to highlight the relative, relativity of marginalization across these and other groups encountering varying levels of material disparity. Discussions of an intersectional framework leads me to discuss the work being done by the Federal Anti-Racism Secretariat where we're developing an anti-racism framework that is intersectional by design. This framework centers historically marginalized First Nations, Métis, Inuit, Black, Asian, racialized, religious minority voices, perspectives and experiences at the core of planning, development, decision-making and implementation. As an intersectional and interdisciplinary tool, the framework addresses the ways different forms of oppression intersect by using racialization as a focal point to address and explore life experiences and inequalities in Canadian society and beyond. 
Any anti-racism framework must recognize that each individual group has distinct histories and current realities, be they political, social, cultural, and economic. Indigenous experiences in Canada are not the same as Black experiences or Asian experiences, and each individual within these cultural groupings is not destined to have the same experiences as all others within that group. History has shown, however, that these groups are more discriminated against and marginalized in Canada compared to white communities, partly because how they are understood or valued is seen through white supremacist, white supremacist settler narratives. By using frameworks such as these, policymakers can also uncover how political, economic, and social structures generate and perpetuate social inequality in all spaces of societies. It can show how institutions produce and replicate systems of oppression based on gender, sexuality, class, race, gender, religion, ability, amongst others, all of which play in simultaneous ways and affect particularly the most marginalized individuals and groups. This approach can also encourage us to make the necessary links and connections between various and concurrent forms of oppression and discriminations, making us realize that injustice cannot be eliminated in isolation. But most importantly, such frameworks could inspire us to work together, collaborating and supporting one another among different movements and initiatives for human rights. Thank you for that, Derek. It, it really the piece that that is resonating and coming home for me is that we really have to, you know, have an intersectional framework and work in coalition um with each other on these issues of human rights of justice of inclusion because otherwise we're we're, we're not going to get very far unless we're working together on on these pieces and it's something that Pride Work Canada has been thinking about for ourselves and how can we model um a truly just workplace as well and and is something that we'll be working on um as we continue to go um I've realized how uh far we've gotten into this conversation already um um, and that uh, I am conscious of, of time. So I apologize to the over 300 folks that we've had uh, here with us today, because I won't be able to ask that many questions from the audience. Um, but I do want to um, ask uh, this question, which is, um, and, and please for our panelists, if you want to, to unmute and, and, and jump in, please do. Um, but also if you can keep your responses um, uh, uh, slightly brief, um, I'd like to, uh, so this is from uh, Lisa, she, her. I'd like to hear what conversations the panelists are having with leaders in our legal justice and police communities. How many, if any, acknowledge the systemic change required and how optimistic are panelists about real change happening? Is there anybody who, who would like to address that question? Aaron? Uh Thank you. So I've actually been approached repeatedly over the last several years from uh, police and corrections because they um, are aware that they don't know what they're doing when it comes to trans plus communities and that they would like to do better. Uh, so I think that's an important piece to know that they've been coming to me and uh, I have attended um, and spoken at uh, several uh, conferences, conventions, and small groups ranging from a few dozen in an RCMP detachment to 750 uh, police leaders from uh, across North America. And I've been approached both by um, DC Corrections and Federal Corrections to help them to update their policies on trans plus prisoners. So on the surface, that's very helpful uh, in that they know and they're coming and they're asking for some help. Uh, however, you know, how far it's going to get, whether anything I um, suggest to them, how much of what I suggest to them gets implemented uh, remains to be seen and uh, how many others they are speaking to and asking for advice. And you know, of course, I'm talking to prison populations as well as people who are running the, the show. Um, but, you know, policies are good policies are important, but they're only a, a, a first a starting point. Uh, they have to be communicated. People have to be trained. They have to be uh, they have to be enforced. People have to be supported and rewarded for making changes. So all of that is yet to be seen is yet to come. And I don't know if it's going to happen, but I, I tend to be an optimist and believe that uh, over time, I've, you know, looking back historically, I've seen a lot of progress and looking forward, I hope to see a lot of progress as well, but I'm not an optimist that it's fast. I think it's way slower than any of us want it to be, but I, I do think it will come. Uh, 
Oh, I need to uh, turn on my mic. Um, so we have uh, Harlan um, has asked to, to jump in on this question, and um, uh, I think our panelists are supportive of that. So definitely want to hear uh, Harlan's take, and then we'll go to um, after that our calls to action. Sure. Uh, thank you so much. One again, I was like, what do I have to offer into this really this conversation? Because this is amazing, panelists, um, just amazing. Uh, one, okay, because I've been reflecting upon this like for the past like 10 days around um, because I think that the system has been set up um, to replicate itself right and, um, and and just mirrored with inequities right and systems of oppression and um, and like when we look at the residential boarding school when we look at residential boarding schools experience or when we look at like the 60 scoop, and other policies that have been created like, for Indigenous people, right? So one, I think that Indigenous people are unique. One is, is that we are original to this territory and this land, right? And so there's no other place for us to go. Like we're of this territory, we're of this land. And then, um, and, and so the telling of stories and narratives only within a Western framework, uh, like I love the opening uh, by Angela in that like talking about the pink purge, but then actually took some time to explain around indigenous people and all of the oppressions that we and the cultural genocide that we've experienced. Now, the whole question around optimism is I have to be optimistic because the alternative is way too scary. In that if I'm not optimistic, I'm pessimistic. And I would like to, and when you go down this pessimism of like, yeah, if colonizers and this pessimistic theory is, is that they intentionally set up the system because they are inherently evil so that they can benefit. And once you go down that pathway, how do we set and stand, like sit in authentic relations with someone that you consider evil? And so I think that there is a lot of like colonizers and white people uh, that I kind of liken like that are in, like goldfish, like, like a goldfish, does a goldfish know that they're in the water? And I think that as activists and as community organizers, we must remind all of the folks with privilege, and I actually have privilege, that you have to remove the goldfish from the water so that they can have reflection around the water. So, <laughs> I love white people and I love colonizers. Um, I love how like when you hear these like bootstrap conversations of like, wow, I got this promotion or I got this job. Damn, I am great. But there is like little reflection of like, wow, this entire education system, what we learn, what we read, who teaches, who sets up the system looks like me was set up by colonizers for colonizers and the hegemony and the primacy of given to western thought and western ways of being and i think it's just the in happenstance of like literally folks really believe that that is the best that they have a corner on truth and they happenstance like the goldfish existing within their body <laughs> within their and i have to be optimistic in which that uh, folks, some folks did, but I don't think a majority of folks are evil. And I cannot be pessimistic, because where do we go from there? And I do see that there has been incredible changes, like me actually being here talking as a two-spirit Indigenous person, me as an Indigenous uh, translation lead in a leadership position, me being a, a co-PI within research, me like and there are many other folks like um, Simon, Mary Simon in a leadership position so that we can self-actualize myself, self-actualize for my community. And there's a determination and sovereignty of body and sovereignty of land. And so I think that I am an optimist out of necessity because the system, the that if there is such intentionality to oppress, 
to kill, to obliterate those that are different is too scary for me to actually go down that pathway. And so I would like to say that there is like ignorance and bliss because I don't know what other options that I have open to myself. And it goes back to how I said of like justice is sharing and we must share. And so that that dining table is open to all. Thank you. I would like to just add to that. Thank you so much, Harlan, for sharing that message. Um, my, my organization, Uplift Black, as the leader of that organization, it is my job to create a safe space for everybody who's involved, as well as um, the people who are coming to us. And I can't do that while collaborating with the police. I can't do that. So um, we don't have that answer. I, I, can't, I can't say what uh, movements have been made because my focus is elsewhere um, and I, 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 they have a journey um, but I'm not going to be part of that journey. Uh, I could just add, add one, one thing. You know, I, I see that part of my obligation as somebody who now lives as a privileged white man with education and all those wonderful things that part of my obligation is is to talk to those people because I can, and they will listen to me in a way that Absolutely. they will to people. Uh, to, I that see that. Yeah. And so I, I feel like it's part of my job is to go into the lion's den, if you will, and, um, you know, put myself in front of them. And I can tell you, you could have heard a pin drop when I'm talking to 750 cops. And I said, I can't be the only trans person in this room. They just all froze. They just all froze. It was not a friendly environment after that. Uh, but it was. But I got in the door, and I can stand in front of them and talk to them and tell them things that other people will never get through that door. Well, not never, but won't get through that door anytime soon. So I see that as part of my job because I have so much privilege. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Grateful for, for everybody's sharing. I am conscious of time, however, um, and uh, I could add a lot to this conversation as well. I, I would love to continue to, to discuss with all of you, um, but could we uh, end with very quick 30 second each uh, call to action that you would like for those who are in attendance today? Um, and maybe we can um, uh, go backwards from uh, uh, who was introduced. So uh, Derek, would you mind going first? Sure, thanks for that. So my call to action is gonna be very simple. It's uh, to be bold and bold for me is an acronym. So B is for bolster the voices of those with expertise, lived experience and evidence-based knowledge of communities affected. O is for open space up for diversity, equity, and inclusion to be a reality at all levels of decision making. Leverage opportunities for co establishing frameworks that engage the assets, expertise, knowledge, and strengths of communities to inform policy making. And decenter, deconstruct, decolonize beliefs, societal norms, and practices that you may have which undergird systems of oppression. That's it. Aaron? Thank you. I've, uh, I'll keep it really brief because I know I've talked a lot. Uh, I just put into the chat um, a link for uh, employers to do a workplace self-assessment on trans inclusion in their place of work. So I encourage everybody to take a look at that and make use of that. Shelley? I have so many, Jade, but uh, <laughs> I'm trying to narrow it down to just one, one call to action. Um, as a leader of a not-for-profit organization, as a community-based organization, the constant struggle for funding. <laughs> it is a, like a never-ending game of whether we're going to be able to keep the office doors open. And the not-for-profit sector, charitable sector, needs a complete and total revamp. <laughs> um, it's going to be some time before that happens, and I'm hearing that there is some work happening. But in the meantime, <laughs> we need your dollars. Our organizations like Pride at Work, Up of Black, you know, um, like all of the different uh, panelists, um, they're part of incredible organizations that need you to, to literally just sign up for monthly donations, do whatever it takes. Um, you can't rely on funding um, from grants. Um, because it requires a lot of competition. It requires um, partnership with um, charitable organizations that may not have been uh, uh, 
done the work in order for them to be a safe space to, to collaborate with. It's all these, you know, jumping through hoops. Um, at the end of the day, this is the right, you know, the data. I understand we talk about it. Somebody talked about it there. Like we're, I'm, I'm exhausted with the data. Everybody knows the facts, right? We know the facts. Um, so the only way we're going to change it is, um, you know, getting out there and putting our money and, you know, where our mouth is, um, getting off these panel, um, you know, and actually getting out and collaborating and meeting. Now that we can open up, um, you know, queer, trans, to us LGBTQ, um, QI members about your community, racialized people of your community, go and speak to them and say, what can I do? And you know, we need to, we need you. I don't care about your cottage. I don't care about your. You know, you're having a barbecue, great. But other than that, I don't care about your barbecue. <laughs> let's, you know, let's 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 put some some time and effort into making some change, um, and it's only going to happen with action. Thank you, Shelley. So I'm hearing uh, be bold, be optimistic, um, and do the work, you know, commit to action. So I'm so grateful for this really, really wonderful panel. Uh, uh, Derek, Shelley, Aaron, I, I was honored, honestly, uh, to, to be uh, speaking with the three of you. Um, as, as so we'll go to uh, Angela to, to close, um, and then a final word from Harlan and Miigwech Harlan for um, the beautiful words that you've spoken today. I think I can speak for everyone when I say thank you. Thank you, Jade, for moderating this wonderful panel. Aaron, Shelley, Derek, uh, your insights were uh, truly invaluable. Uh, I want to thank the sponsors, Norton Rose Fulbright and Black HR Professionals Association. Uh, thank you all the attendees who came in to, to tune in today um, and, and uh, bore witness uh, to these insights. Uh, the session was recorded, uh, so you can uh, check out the links and documents that we're going to provide. And please come to future Pro Pride events. Uh, lastly, um, uh, but not least, Thank you, Harlan. I'm going to leave the last words to you. Um, thank you so, so much. What an honor and an amazing uh, conversation as well as the amazing work. Um, I just would like to offer a couple of like closing remarks. One, I thoroughly enjoyed this conversation of looking at uh, belonging, justice, as well as dignity and how like the EDI or the JETI, however, like equity, diversity and inclusion um, going back around history, because I think that we have to like look at the history. EDI came out of basically uh, the tech companies, the white, cis, often straight men hiring people of color to do the work. And then once they made that investment, they were like, shnikes, how do we protect that investment? Human capital. Like, these words are like nutty. Um, and so it was like, so that they could keep the um, racialized people happy so that they could work. It was not moved by justice. It was moved by protecting capital, human capital, it's wacky, right? And so the shifting to belonging and as well as justice and dignity, I think is welcomed. And I think that we have to start moving that rather than just doing protecting resources or looking at humans as capital. The finally is, is that, you know, this year marks uh, 2021 um, as marking uh, 529 years of colonization. And a part of my optimism, as well as my belief, is that it may take another 529 years to go back to a system of justice and to undo all of the violences and the destruction that has been brought to this territory by non native people. And so it's playing the long game. And I know that the work that I do today is merely planting seeds and that I will never probably experience what I'm working towards, but that does not discourage me, nor it, it actually emboldens and, and propels me to do more work so that we can make plant more seeds in which that folks will experience belonging, justice and dignity. And then finally, I think the big calls to action and what we've heard today from the speakers is, is that we must challenge conceptions of like um, the presumption of innocence. So many well-intentioned liberal community organizers and activists like say, here is a call to justice or here is a call to uh, salvation and uh, of equity, right? 
But when that call is not rooted or grounded or inclusive of Indigenous and Two-Spirit people in meaningful and substantive ways, that call is rooted within a colonial framework. You know, I often hear people like, here is the pathway for equality, or here's the pathway for salvation, especially within the LGBT community. And that there is no culpability in those well-intentioned community organizers to take pause, to say, hmm, it is my colonial ways, my colonial forefathers, my colonial frameworks that totally messed it over for Indigenous and Two-Spirit people, where we had full equality, full citizenship, and full dignity and respect within our respective nations. And you know, part of that whole thing is to waking up to the history and challenging this presumption of innocence. Any call, any action, that does not begin or include indigenous people and or two-spirit people is colonial. And it becomes today's colonizing, which, and colonization today is so incredibly subtle. No longer are they killing us and putting us into market graves, but they just simply don't invite us to meetings. They simply don't hire us. And they don't give us that corner office in which that we can actually actualize and self-determine and have sovereignty of body and sovereignty of land. Colonization is incredibly wily, subtle. And that is why I go back to that goldfish analogy and that we must constantly remind folks that they must get out of the goldfish bowl so they can reflect upon the limitations, the tininess, but also the simplicity that that goldfish bowl represents. I would like to thank my panelists, all of the organizers, and uh, the amazing conversation and discussion that we had today. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.